service. This is the worship service for Fletcher's Chapel United Methodist Church for March the 7th. And we're glad that you're with us today. I was going to say this morning. It might be this morning or the afternoon or whenever, even during the week. We appreciate your being here and we hope you'll find our service meaningful to you. Would you listen for this call to worship? Called by Christ, scattered by circumstance, we gather as one. Scattered by place and time, we gather for purpose. Blessed by God's wisdom, we gather to learn. Amazed by God's love, we gather to worship. Scattered by illness, we gather in love. Our first hymn of the morning is How Great, Great Thou Art, and we'll be singing the first and the second verses.
disease. Our pandemic seems to be on the decline, although it's had a little spike, a little, little jump from where it was going down, a little plateau. We, we're going to uh, pray that that's getting better, but people are still in need of groceries. So if you can contribute to that, we would invite you to come by. Uh, another announcement, uh, this would be for the Finance Committee and the Church Council. We are going to meet on March the 10th. Uh, Finance Committee will meet at 6 o'clock with the Church Council meeting immediately after that. And uh, one of the purposes is, is to look at the new protocols, the new uh, conditions that are coming out from the conference about being able to gather together. I am hopeful that we will be able to gather back by Easter. Uh, that we'll be able to come into the sanctuary and, and worship on that special holy day. Uh, we'll see what it takes and we'll see what's going on as far as the pandemic's concerned. And, and uh, if we can safely worship together in a meaningful way, then uh, we will try to get back here on Easter. And we'll be discussing that at the church council meeting uh, on uh, um, Wednesday, March the 10th. Wednesday, March the 10th. We pray that you will... Uh, uh, we hope that you will join us. If you're not receiving our robocalls, we send out a two-minute call on Sunday morning and on Tuesday and Thursday evenings. If you're not receiving those and would like to, please give us a call. We are about to study a, uh, from the United Methodist Discipline the social principles. That's uh, the way the church deals with uh, common uh, the, our, our situations with humanity in a modern situation. Um, very human way with sound biblical and theological background for us. So uh, if you're not receiving those, give me a call and uh, we will try to arrange to have you do that. Um, let's see here. That's, I believe that's all the announcements that I have. Um, if you have concerns for prayer for people, uh, don't ever hesitate to give me a call. I can see to it that they get put on uh, referred to the church's prayer team, and we would be glad to do that. Um, that happens from time to time when people have got a special need. There's a serious illness. There's a, a reason why people need it. It might be a, a time of grief. It might be a time of, of healing that's needed. But if there's ever a need for prayer, uh, please call the parsonage, and uh, we'll see to it that the prayer team gets that, and it gets out to the whole church. Would you pray with me? O oh God, our guide and guardian, you have called us apart from the busyness of the world, each of us into the nurture of our own homes this morning. Grant us all your grace to worship you in spirit and in truth, to the comfort of our souls, and to the upbuilding of each of us into your kingdom work. We thank you for your presence in our lives and for all the blessings that you afford us in this life. We thank you for this sacred place which you have provided to us to worship you. And we long for the day when we can safely gather back together and worship you in a spirit of Christian fellowship. Once again, we thank you for those who have struggled to develop and produce the vaccines which will render us safe from this terrible pandemic. We are indeed thankful for those who administer those vaccines. And we express our concern who, for whatever reason, refuse to accept the vaccines or refuse to adopt behavior that will keep others safe. Help each of us to be mindful of all our neighbors and desire to keep them safe. We lift up to you this morning all of those who are ill or firm, infirm. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless them, give them healing where it's needed, strength where it's needed, encouragement where it's needed, whatever the needs of the people are, Lord, you stand ready to meet them in every way. We thank you and praise you for that. We lift this prayer to you this morning, this time to you this morning, in the name of him who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Psalter reading for this morning is the 19th Psalm, and I would lift that up to you from the Common English Bible. Heaven is declaring God's glory. The sky is proclaiming His handiwork. One day gushes the news to the next, and one night informs another what needs to be known. Of course, there's no speech, no words. Their voices can't be heard, but their sound extends throughout the world. Their words reach the ends of the earth. God has made a tent in heaven for the sun. The sun is like a groom coming out of his honeymoon suite, like a warrior. It thrills at running its course. It rises in one end of the sky, its circuit is complete at the other. Nothing escapes its heat. The Lord's instruction is perfect, reviving one's very being. The Lord's laws are faithful, making naive people wise. The Lord's regulations are right, gladdening the heart. The Lord's commands are pure, giving light to the eyes. Honoring the Lord is correct, lasting forever. The Lord's judgments are true. All of these are righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than tons of pure gold. And they are sweeter than honey, even dripping off the honeycomb. No doubt about it, your servant is enlightened by them. There is great reward in keeping them. But can anyone know what they've accidentally done wrong? Clear to me of any unknown sin, and save your servant from willful sins. Don't let them rule me. Then I'll be completely blameless. I'll be innocent of great wrongdoing. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. It's always a good time for us to reaffirm our faith with one another. May I invite you, maybe even to stand where you are, but to recite with me our traditional Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Old Rugged Cross, verses 1 and 2.
that time in our service when we would pass the collection plate. Uh, thanks to all of you who have been uh, supporting the church financially. Uh, we do appreciate all of that. And we would invite all of you to participate in, in that support of the church. Uh, as one fellow used to say, give till it feels good. It is easy to offer our money and our gold, but God desires our hearts and our lives. Even as we offer our gifts, let us reflect on how we might give our hearts and lives so that others may know the truth of God's wisdom and love. Would you pray with me? Precious Lord, may the gifts that we present to you be gifts of love. May the offerings we share the offerings of our hearts. May each gift be blessed by your grace that others may know the truth of your wisdom and your love. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning might be very familiar to many of you. It comes from Exodus, the 20th chapter, first 17 verses, and you probably know it and remember it as the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You must have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever, of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them, because I, the Lord, your God, am a passionate God. I punish children for their parents' sins, even to the third and fourth generation of those that hate me. But I am loyal and gracious to the thousandth, thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were of no significance. The Lord won't forgive anyone who uses his name that way. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it, not you, nor your sons, nor daughters, your male or female servants, your animals, or the immigrant who is living with you. Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh day. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that your life will be long on the fertile land that the Lord your God has given you. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. Do not desire your neighbor's house. Do not desire or try to take your neighbor's wife male or female servant, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And our epistle lesson for the morning comes to us from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. I'll read from the first chapter, the 18th through the 25th verses, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. The message of the cross is foolishness, to those who are being destroyed. But it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. It is written in Scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? In God's wisdom, he determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through its wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believed through the foolishness of preaching. Jews ask for signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to Jews and a foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger 
than human strength. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of his holy written word. Now our gospel text for this morning comes from the second chapter of the Gospel of John. I'll be reading the 13th through the 22nd verses. John 2, 13 through 22. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currency sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it is written, Passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, By what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, It took 46 years to build this temple. And you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Would you pray with me? Holy, gracious, loving God, may the words that I speak in this moment, the thoughts that we think and the feelings that we experience just now, may they all be acceptable in your sight. And may they all continue to teach us of your great love for us. And may they inspire us once again to live for you. In Christ we pray. Amen. This story from the Gospel of John about Jesus is sort of unique. Actually, that story is, is printed in all the Gospels. About one who said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Took a whip made out of ropes, overturned the tables of the money chambers, changers scattered their coins and whipped the animals and chased the, the animal sellers out of the temple. They were exchanging money. They were selling animals. In a way, they were doing this to support the temple, but they were also doing it to support those leaders, those religious leaders of the day who were making some profit. You see, if you came to Jerusalem in time for Passover, you had to pay the temple tax. Every Jew had to pay the temple tax, and it had to be paid in Jewish currency. So if you came from Rome, or you came from any part of Asia Minor, or any of the surrounding areas, and you came to pilgrim to, to, to Jerusalem, you had to exchange the money that you had as common currency, and they would take advantage of that. Also, you had to come, and according to the old Jewish law, you had to sacrifice possibly cattle, possibly sheep, possibly birds, whatever it was for your particular kind of sacrifice. And, and you were supposed to bring an animal from your own herd or your own flock without blemish. But instead of doing that and all the trouble and all the aggravation that caused, they had things set up right there in the temple. You come in, pay out a few coins, pay out whatever the fee was, and get your own animal and have that sacrificed, all to support the convenience of what it was. But Jesus saw what was going on there, exchanging money, selling animals, doing all of these things that had nothing to do with the sacredness of the temple. What prompted his violent, his, his I hate to use that word violent, let's use the word forceful, uh, forceful acts. Here was Jesus. Jesus, who at the end of his life had been denied, had been betrayed, had been abandoned, had been tortured and had been crucified and didn't lift a finger of any of those people that had done any of those things to him. As a matter of fact, forgave them all. What caused him, what prompted him to act so forcefully to these people in the temple? The temple. The temple that was truly sacred. 
The temple that in their culture, in their time, was considered and was the dwelling place of Yahweh, truly the house of God. When we see the word Bethel, we see the words of, Jew, of Hebrew Bethel, which means house of God. And truly that is what the temple was, especially to these people in that day and time. People came, they related to God there in that place. Oh, they knew God was everywhere, but they knew it was something special. It was some place special that they could go and find this close relationship with God. And that's where they could go and practice the sacrifices of their day. Just like they did in the Old Testament, just like the Old Testament law commanded them what to do. So into this sacred and holy place came these people that were doing business for convenience sake for the people who had come into the temple. In essence, if you would, they desecrated the temple. They desecrated that holy space. And that's what enraged Jesus. That's what enraged Jesus. Usually the meek and gentle Jesus that we think about, that tore him up. That aggravated him. Seeing Jesus enraged the disciples remembered, and it was a quote from the 69th Psalm that said, Passion for your house consumes me. And they saw that that truly was the effect that it had upon Jesus. Clearly, Jesus had upset the status quo. All of this business that was being done in there, the changing of money, the, the selling of these animals for sacrifice, that what he did that day interfered with the business and the status quo of the temple that, that seemed to keep things going on at every even pace. It truly was against the wishes of God Almighty and his son, Jesus Christ. And the religious leaders, seeing what he had done, and as if he was acting like, if you will, a prophet of the Old Testament, asked him by what authority he did this. What sign could he show? Just like the Old Testament prophets, Elijah, if you will, if you remember that case on Mount Carmel where, where he called down the fire, where, where he and the prophets of Baal had come together and they, they each laid out an animal to be sacrificed to their God, the, the sacrifices to Baal and, and Elijah's sacrifice to the Lord God Almighty. And, and, and the, the prophets of Baal called the fire. There was no fire coming. So Elijah took water and he put it all around, put a moat around his altar, soaked all of everything, the wood up, the meat up, soaked up everything in his sacrifice, and God sent the fire down and consumed the animal. That was Elijah. Elisha also, it, prophets... Brought, brought miracles. Prophets did signs in those days. The, Elisha was credited with, with having come to a widow, a widow who was poor, who had nothing, who, who was on her last meal for her last son. And, and he said, have you got any oil in the house? And she said, yes. And he had the people from all over the city bring their containers that they could put oil in. And she filled from their, the, all of their containers from her little bottle of oil that never ran out. That was the sign that Elisha gave. We are familiar with Daniel and Daniel's ability to interpret dreams. These people were able to give signs and the, the religious leaders of the day asked Jesus, well, if you're like a prophet, if you've got the authority to do these things, show us what sign will you give? And that's when Jesus told them, if you destroy this temple, I'll build it back in three days. Now we get into an interesting conversation here that you see over and over again in the gospel according to John where Jesus is talking about things at a very spiritual level and they get hung up on the things of the physical level and, and we see this happening here and, and they said it took 46 years to build this building but Jesus wasn't talking about that building he was talking about the temple of his own body that it would be destroyed in three days it would rise again What's the lesson in all of this for us? What is there about our relationship with God that we can get so impassioned about that Jesus got impassioned about his father's house? What is there in our lives that we would feel is that, is, is that necessary for us to be, to be bothered about, to be excited about, to be thinking about? I would say it's too easy in this pandemic to be too apathetic 
It's too easy to be concerned about the things of this world and to put Christ up on a shelf to be brought out when we think we need him. And that's sad. We feel like we can compartmentalize our lives. Imagine, you've got your work life, you've got your leisure life, you've got your school life, you've got your shopping life, you've got your church or your religious life. Put them all in little conventional, uh, convenient shoeboxes to be open when and where you need them, how and some ever. That's not what God wants for your life. All of you. A part of all of you. That's what God wants. God wants to be above all of those shoeboxes. God doesn't want your religious life, your spiritual life, when we're able to get back together, your church life to be set apart from the rest of your life. But God wants to be over all of that life. What can you do? What can you do that you can be impassioned about? Do you spend some time each and every day in devotion? Do you spend some time each and every day reading your Bible? Spending some time in prayer and not just bringing to God what your prayers are, but listening, listening for what God has to say to you. I was reading in the upper room the other day, and it was a fellow who had been overhearing his child talking on the telephone. And as they were talking on the telephone and ending that call, I said, now, now before we hang up, is there anything else that you wanted to say? And it brought to mind that person in their prayers. And it brought to mind that, that maybe when, when that person is praying, when you are praying, when I am praying, that after we have presented our, our thanksgiving, after we've presented our praise, after we've presented our requests and our confessions to God, that, that we just spend some time in silence, listening, listening for the movement of God and the Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives as to what we can be about. Daily devotion might be the first thing in the morning, might be the last thing at night. Also, Thanksgiving before your meals. Do you take time to give thanks to God for that sustenance that you have before you? There's a lot of people in this world that don't have that. Yes, we go out and we work for it and we earn the money and we buy the groceries and we do all of that. But, but between here and, and, and goodness knows what, starvation, there's the grace of God that provides us with the health and the ability that we have to be able to go out and earn those things and buy those things. Do we thank God for that? Do we put God at the center of our lives? Do we pause during the day as we face our daily situation, daily work, daily problems, decisions to make, choices that we have to make throughout the day, do we stop and say, Lord, what would you do? Lord, what should I do? You ever called a friend? Call a friend to inquire of that friend how they're doing, to encourage that friend in what they're about, to laugh together, to cry together, just to be there for each other in a very Christ-like way just to be there and to help out in ways that you could be meaningful to that friend, to that, to that acquaintance, to that companion, to whoever. And always be mindful that God is your source. As Jesus recorded it in Matthew's Gospel, Come unto me, all you who are weary and are carrying a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. God is there for us in all the ways that we need. When life becomes too much, when life bears down on our shoulders and we just think we can't go any farther, pray. Pray. Give God the opportunity to give you the help that you need and the strength that you need and the encouragement that you need to go on from day to day even in the most difficult things you must face. This same Jesus, who's passionately supported the temple as the place where God dwelt, will also support you as the place where God dwells, as you are committed also to being that sacred place.
Our closing hymn is Oh How I Love Jesus, and we will sing the first and the last verses. Share that love with others. Amen. 